the day I got sentenced to death was so profound to me, I was the only one in the courtroom willing to look anybody in the eye. And everybody I looked in the eye put their head down. And yet I was just found guilty of rape, murder, and kidnapping of a woman I never met at the age of 21. I should have had my head down as a guilty party. But God told me not to do that. When I was taken upstairs when the power was out, they put me in this giant room. And I looked at everybody in the courtroom below, uh, in a courtyard below me. All these people milling about. No sound. It was eerie to hear the silence. And they looked up and saw me. They started making faces. Fuck you. <sighs> Hope you fry yours, you scumbag. I didn't say anything. But I swear to God, I heard this voice just as clear as they say, look them in the eye. So they take me in the courtroom. The judge hammers me 30 to 60 years plus the death penalty. The jury gives me the death penalty. He adds 60 years to it. So I start talking to him. I said, Your Honor, you know and I know I didn't commit this crime. I said, you want to know why? Look at you. You can't even look me in the face. You're about to sentence me to die. You can't even look me in the eye. He said, is that all you got to say? I know. I said, you can go to hell. <laughs> and I had the courage I didn't weep. I didn't do it, David. Why should I be broken? And that's what the message was. See, this is the craziest thing. Had that bolt of lightning not hit the courthouse, I wouldn't have thought this way. I was so angry that I didn't understand a lot of the language that was being used. I was embarrassed by my education. And then, boom, the lights go out. The power just seemed to be taken from them in that moment. <laughs> Not just electrical, all of their power. I want to reflect on your first day in your prison cell. We spoke about today's social media whereby people are relying on the validation from others online. How they are perceived online is how they perceive themselves. And in this instance, in 1981, you were convicted and labeled, much like people do on social media, as a rapist murderer who would probably shout from the cells that you are such thing. That was your reputation. Even though deep inside you knew you weren't those things. You were young Nick Yaris, innocent, and should be a free man. How did you stop in those early moments on day one? How did you stop the opinions and labeling of others from ever infiltrating the reputation, the reputation you had with yourself? It's not possible. You, you can't separate that story that you tell yourself no, about no, yourself. No. It's not possible to do that on the first day. How did you feel? On my first day of being incarcerated or my first day being under a death sentence? Which one do you want to know? Both. First day I was out of it. I was a drug addict and I was stoned out of my mind and I was recovering. It took me weeks to get my shit together to feel the pain of what was coming down the pipe. My first day on actual death row, I got drug off a bus by four guards wearing helmets and clubs. And they weren't nice about it. And they lined me up against the wall. And a lieutenant walked up and he said, dead men do not speak in my unit. Do you understand me? He said, you're dead. Your mother, your father, everyone you knew is dead. Therefore, dead men do not speak in my unit. Do you understand me? Like an idiot, what did I do? Yes, sir. Bam. Pop me right in the mouth with the back of his hand. And he turned to his boys and said, 30 seconds. You knew what that meant, right? They fed, he fed me to those guards for 30 seconds. Oak sticks. It's about three feet of oak with a leather handle so that it doesn't fly out of your hand and they double hand it and they're whipping on your legs, all the back of your legs, all the back of your buttocks, all your back. Don't leave no facial marks. But then I turned and fucked up and they hit me in the head. So they throw me in a cell. I'm in the cell now, David, and I'm thinking, this is insane. They just told me I can't even speak in my cell. I can't even get up off the floor. The nurse comes by. Yaris, AM6841, can you stand up? I was like, oh, shit. So I wasn't going to talk. 
I deliberately decided I was going to make her look at me by not talking. You know what I mean? She was prepared for that. She said, you've been uh, put into B block and the following procedures are to be observed for you to see medical staff. You fill out a DC-136 request form asking to see a medical personnel and you write out as best you can what your ailments are or your needs are. Do you understand? I wouldn't answer. The guard stepped up, knew the routine, and he said, inmate makes no reply. Kept calling me an inmate. About the fourth question in, she still didn't look at me. And they walked off together. And I realized I was being left there like a piece of meat. My face was bleeding. They had done a good job on me. And she's telling me how to fucking fill out a piece of paper to see a medical professional. I'm thinking, this is going to be hard. So that was my first day on death row. Can you tell me some of the hideous things that you went through? Two guards taught me about Christianity by beating me, by making a joke about it. So... It was real hard to face them on my last day, knowing that they didn't realize something. I don't give a fuck if you put a mask on. You wear the same boots to work every day, you idiot. I know who you are. What about the dog fights? When they attack you, they put helmets on and, and disguise themselves. But they wear the same boots to work every day. I know who you are. I knew for years the ones that broke my face. I never went after them. I could have got them back. Why? Just knowing that I knew who you were was enough for me. And you pretended to be that nice guard. You offered me an extra piece of food. I said no for my own pride. I said no, thank you, sir. And I was very sincerely nice to them. The one I, I felt bad for them. Anybody that had to beat me and torture me for something I didn't do, I felt bad for them. They got in the wrong. And the crazy thing is, they were committing the wrong on me, and I was being better than them. Because if I knew I was committing the same wrong that they were, I would be horrified, yet some of them wouldn't. They wouldn't even be bothered by it. They'd be says, I heard him. Fuck it, I don't care how many innocent dudes are in here. I'm having my fun. At one point, I refused to fight again, and they fucking beat the shit out of me. Hard, too, man. I've been stabbed on fucking, what? At least five different occasions. I've had serious concussions. I had to fight one dude with my arm separated, my shoulder was separated, and I had to be devious. Man, I've been, oh. It's the legs, though, that they really got me on. They beat you on your legs because a lot of times they could get away with that, you know what I mean? So you'd be walking down the block and they just out of nowhere hit you with a club. Pow! And inflict all that damage on you. And then I turned the game on them. Want to know how I did it? I figured out that you get less of a beating if you can make them laugh halfway through it. <laughs> David, this is the craziest thing. At one point, guards used to be like wanting to hang out with me in front of my cell because they were so fascinated by me or so entertained by me. They would literally request to come and be around me. And I made the whole block light up with laughter after a minute. When they stopped that no talking rule, I changed the game. I literally unleashed the most hilarious gallows humor you can imagine. I had fucking B block rocking. When I went down the block, most of the guys would be yelling at me in taunts and laughter. It's my boy, Wigger Nick. What's up, Mr. Wigger? And I'd be like, oh, my God, they let you out of your sarcophagus? What's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. If you, do you know who has more power than the king? 
the jester. That's true. So I I I'm, learned to be Death Rose Jester so well. When I came, I I went out, I started going out for court. And a lot of the guards realized when I was having all this attention with the news BB and I was the first guy asked for DNA, a lot of them thought, shit, this guy's actually innocent. And it started bugging some of them, and the other ones just loved me. It was funny, like I had my little protector. So Ezekiel Ruiz, if you're still alive, I fucking love your Spanish ass. Thank you, boy. So Zeke was so cool that um, he made every effort to let me be funny. Do you understand how gracious that is when someone's letting you get your humor on? You know what I mean? It's like Jimmy Carr letting you tell jokes. He's like really stepping back and giving you the platform, right? But that's how Zeke was. And oh my God, I used to torment the guards. I used to have so much fun with laughter that they left, like invariably they left me alone, didn't they? And I went off on my little journey reading books. I had a guard come to me one time and literally he said, I got a 17 year old son and he's been studying and then asked me all these questions and took notes and went home and helped his son with his homework. Yeah. They didn't have the internet back in the eighties, but they had Nick Yaris with a fucking stack of books. Right. But that was a really cool thing. Cause his name was house and he was a really cool guard. But he came to me and he was like, you've been reading this about Greek mythology? And I said, yes. He said, well, can you tell me? And he, and he started asking me all these things. I said, well, I actually got a book. So we went through the book together and I gave him all this help. And he was like, I'm going to tell my son this. And it really helped. And so that was a dangerous thing, though, David. You want to know why? That man could have gotten himself killed trusting someone to be a human being that wasn't a human and I, I actually cautioned him on it. I felt bad later. I was such a nice person in there. I tried to tell him, hey, man, don't come up to my window like that again and make your neck all vulnerable and, and be all at soft like that because I could have killed you. And he was like, why would you say that? And I said, I'm just telling you the next fucker is not going to be nice because I've seen that, you know? Um especially during the riot, all the officers that were not really aggressive invariably were the ones that had the most damage done to them. The one that got his eye put out or was stabbed multiple times was actually a really cool guard, and I liked them. And it's a shame that it was, like, it's so wrong. The nicest guard in the block gets the worst beating just because he didn't, he didn't have enough sinister in him to be fearful of his back. You know what I mean? Because he didn't do wrong to people. That guy, I want to apologize for making you revisit some of those traumas. Oh, no, don't do that. Oh, I love I, it. I, well, I know because you say that death row was a gift. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Thank God I went through it. It's like a fun memory to you. No, I kind of realized the reason that they're making a play about me with Adrian Brody starring as me is because I managed to pull off going to death row and coming back with not only my humanity intact, but enhanced. The most profound moment of it all was my last day. DNA proves me innocent. After 8,057 days of solitary confinement, both guards and inmates wept in front of me as I walked by them. Profound. Murderers who had killed up to 10 fucking people stood in their door with tears. Yeah, Nikki, you're getting out of here. Fucking love you, boy. Guards called me by my first name finally. 